I'm Ryan, and I'll be introducing uh, Stuart, Stuart Valentine. Stuart Valentine has played an active role in positive impact investment movement since 2000. As an impact investment advisor, he is passionate about building meaningful systemic change in the world of finance towards a more sustainable life supporting investment model. Stuart serves on the research advisory board of, of ethical markets media in the area of social venture capital and sustainable community development. He is often invited to speak nationally about the conscious investment process and mega trend drivers behind the growing green economy. Since 2009, Stuart has been a part of the adjunct facility at MIU, uh, teaching in the MBA and sustainable li living departments on the theme of environmental, social, and governance uh, analysis, impact investing, sustainable community development, and transformational entrepreneurship. Stuart brings a wealth of knowledge, not only about the field of finance, but a range of sustainability topics which he will share through the stories of his life experiences. Uh, Stuart will be, be uh, presenting on In Place Impact. Stuart Valentine. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so it is Earth Day 2023, but I am guessing, speaking of personal stories, every one of you has a personal story from Earth Day 1970, I would imagine. So raise your hands if you were at Earth Day 1970 somewhere in the world, yeah. So I see a lot of nodding heads, and indeed, I was a whopping 10 years old, but it made a profound impression on me, and here we are all these years later, so hallelujah. I guess the idea took root. Um, so I'm here to talk today about this concept of impact investing and more specifically, the path of capital flows into our local communities in what I call in-place impact. I didn't make that term up. My peer and associate, Stuart Williams, down in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, launched a company called In-Place Impact, which is a consulting firm that works with cities and counties to weave together community partnerships to bring forth greater economic vitality and environmental accountability. So let's, let's start down that road and go into impact investing first and then the concept of in-place impact. Um, first, just a simple definition, impact investing is simply uh, working to expand the uh, objective of the investment process to go beyond the what we call profit first paradigm that we've inherited for the last 500 years. If you think about the definition of investing, most of us would think that it's to maximize profit. And that's certainly been the DNA of investing, again, for a good 500 years. Ever since the East India Corporation, the first chartered corporation was put into um, form in the 1600s, that has been the definition of investing. One of the grandfathers of economics, uh, Nobel Prize winner Milton Friedman, is famous to say, in a, famously said in a 1971 editorial in the Wall Street Journal, that the, the sole purpose of a corporation is to maximize the financial profit for its shareholders and nothing else. That has been the DNA up until the last 30 years or so. Today, what has started out as socially responsible investing evolved into what is called environmental, social, and governance, or ESG investing, is now being described as impact investing. Uh, historically, you've heard the term investing for the single bottom line, which of course is profit first. Uh, to investing for the triple bottom line, which is profit, people, and planet in equal measure. Now, impact investing is a bit of a qualifier on that in that it has a much more local target with the idea of producing what you might think of as a blended return between financial profit, social well-being, and environmental uh, restoration, regeneration. Okay, so that's the backdrop of what in impact investing is doing, and it's quite deeply rooted now within Wall Street uh, to see uh, many of the fund managers are using environmental, social, and governance data as a screening mechanism to determine which companies are likely to show 
uh, superior performance. All right, but let's start at the core. We, we understand what impact is investing about. The core of that is the blended outcomes that take economic, social, racial, and environmental considerations into a balanced whole. Uh, from there, we want to align the principles and practices of impact economics. What, what drives impact investing? And what drives this concept of in-place economics? Well, it starts with a community-wide bottom-up assessment. None of this happens uh, from top-down decree. Uh, the idea of in-place economics is truly a bottom-up phenomenon where communities define their priorities and marshal the creative resources, financial resources, to implement whatever is in highest demand in their locale. Uh, so this concept of a stakeholder, Stakeholders in the community in place impact model would include uh, the educational institutions, the city uh, governance systems, uh, the uh, established business community, the entrepreneurial community, the environmental community that would inform the types of business opportunities that would be explored. So the, the idea of stakeholdership is quite central to in-place economics, and it necessitates a, a, a process of outreach where you are inviting the various stakeholders into the design of a in-place economic model. Um, Fairfield is unique in this regard because of just our history as a educational town, the university system, and the fact that because of the nature of our com community, we have embedded within it a very strong entrepreneurial mindset and skill set. Uh, we are able to teach it in our university system. We have Indian Hills Community College, which also does great work in supporting the kind of entrepreneurial ethic. And that actually is a, a starting point. We have the strong pieces for the kind of integrated uh, economic development uh, known as in-place impact. The other is this idea that we've inherited an economic model that is what you might call win-lose. The idea of survival of the fittest, uh, winner-take-all economic model. Well, I want to pause for a moment and just encourage everybody to investigate the Darwin Project. Charles Darwin's theory of, of evolution actually said survival of the fit, meaning fit in place. Species do best when they are properly fit in their place. And it was Herbert Spencer, a philosopher and uh, sociologist of the time in London, who received Gar Darwin's uh, theory, his written work, before Darwin arrived in, back into England, and Herbert Spencer was the one who coined the term survival of the fittest, which set the tone for our entire cultural mindset ever since. Because when you actually look at nature, nature everywhere and always is freely transmitting information back and forth. Nature everywhere and always cooperates. Well, we came up with this idea that nature is about survival of the fittest and it's dog-eat-dog -dog competition, which was an absolute incorrect interpretation of what it takes to survive on planet Earth, okay? So there's a big, important, what I call source code reset necessary so that we can figure out how to fit into our respective locales. So we go from a win-lose mindset to a win-win-win. Well, what are those winners? So there's the, when it comes to economic development and investment, there's the investor, the individual is bringing forth the capital, the stakeholder community that's going to receive that business solution. And then there's the environment in which that whole 
uh, context is happening. We are all nested within the biosphere, and unless we expressly include the biosphere, our local environment, at the table of every investment decision, <laughs> Eventually, nature has the trump cards. If we do not include nature's principles within our economic development initiatives, ultimately nature will decide that we have outlived our usefulness as a species. Very simple. So think that it's, we're going from win-lose to win-win-win. Investor, community stakeholders, and our local environment. Um, open access and inclusive is, again, a, a principle of natural systems. Uh, the nature of the human society is that there's a tendency in my view these days to think that our salvation lies with our local political leaders or our national political leaders. That if it's just going to be, if, if, if Washington DC would just get the policy right, it would be all okay for us down below. But that's actually, the, it's the exact opposite. Political leaders respond to bottom-up community coherence. When there is a clear uh, stakeholder group that clearly is garnering public support, well then the political machine steps in to support it. Uh, this goes back to Margaret Mead's famous statement that never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So we have to really remind ourselves that uh, to look outside our communities for political change is actually a mistake of the intellect, so to speak, that our big opportunity is right here in our local community. Um, so the other is uh, this idea of a circular economy. We've grown up with, again, uh, a 500-year paradigm that says, look, nature is a, a, a basically just a, a resource rock from which we extract uh, raw materials. Labor is a, a, a human sort of element to be exploited. So we take raw materials, we exploit labor, and we produce stuff. Take, make, waste. Well, that's a linear economic model that has outlived its usefulness. Might have made some sense, you know, 400 years ago when there was unlimited resources uh, and maybe a billion people on the planet. Today, as we approach 8 billion people, and the resource base is all but depleted, or clearly on the defense, we need to actually rethink that idea and start behaving as nature. Nature everywhere and always recycles everything in a circular pattern. Our economic model needs to be mindful of that and wherever possible, designed for reuse again and again. And that's how we arrive at regeneration. Because if we continue on extraction, depletion, we will not find our way into building topsoil, for example, <laughs> which is a, a paramount need for human uh, society, given that we've, uh, I think in Iowa in 1910, the average topsoil depth was something on the order of 14 inches. Today, it's four inches. The average carbon content uh, has depleted about 70%. So eventually, there's just simply not enough topsoil with enough carbon in it to support agriculture as we know it. And yet we have the science, we know the practices. David's already talked about the gardening initiative, but we know how to actually regenerate soil. We have to create the business model that will incentivize capital into it. Um, and let's see, demonstrate. Oh, here's the other thing. I, I keep thinking about the future of business. Because uh, again, I grew up in this world, you know, you develop a product, you sell it, you maximize profit, and you go off and build up wealth for, for yourself. Again, nature doesn't accumulate, uh, nature doesn't monocrop. Nature is always diversified and sharing its wealth throughout the local ecosystem to optimize the conditions for healthy life. So I'm thinking business as we know it, I think we need to start thinking about business evolving out of us a profit-making silo 
and thinking about a business being part of our community ecosystem. So think of a business as an ecosystem service that would include uh, nonprofit uh, activities, uh, would include educational, the support of educational uh, facilities within their community, so that the business resources actually nourish the whole community. Now, some would argue, well, oh, that's socialism, right? Ah, help, you know, the commies are coming, right? Well, actually, let's, let's break through that limited thinking. Let's just, again, use the biomimetic principle of nature's design. Nature is everywhere and always collaborating and sharing, and it creates conducive, uh, conditions conducive to healthy living. So I would say that socialism is too narrow a definition, that we need to actually go beyond that antiquated idea and think of it more in a biomimetic context. And finally, um, I, you know, I, my last point is unlocking the capital choke points. I'm a prime example of being part of the problem as a financial advisor. I have got an incredible amount of regulations around my activities, all of which conspire to have me direct my client investors to send their capital to Wall Street. There's very limited opportunities for me to actually step up and uh, create investment opportunities and vehicles to direct capital into our local communities. That's wrongheaded. Uh, I know one example in Denmark, for example, which has done the best job of moving into a renewable energy uh, generation platform, is that Danish law allows the equivalent of an in, uh, individual retirement account, an IRA, to have a portion of that IRA invested into community energy systems owned by the community itself. That's a simple regulatory tune of the dial. There is no technological impediment for us to redirect capital, our own capital, into developing our own renewable energy uh, systems other than a regulatory framework that says, I'm an investor-owned utility, I'm a Lion Energy, and I want that business for myself, right? So therein is where bottom-up push has to happen from the community itself to make clear that that is, again, uh, that's a monopolistic uh, um, feature of our economy, and it does not serve the conditions for flourishing life. Um, all right, so I mentioned biomimicry. I just wanted to point out that a healthy ecosystem is going to support healthy society. It's going to be very difficult for us to have healthy society on top of a depleted, sick ecosystem. I mean, whether it's dirty air, dirty water, soil that doesn't have nutrient value, you are not going to create community-wide health if you ignore the ecosystem markers of health. So let's get our priorities uh, clear in that regard and start understanding that first order of business is to do a community-wide assessment, make sure we understand where we have opportunities for improvement. Iowa itself, I, David, you might know, I think it's the worst groundwater conditions of any state in the country because of our concentrated agricultural system. Again, nature doesn't monocrop. Why? Because when you monocrop, you create incredible concentrations of toxins. So, through diversity, you minimize the impact of these concentrated toxicities that we, we do through monocropping, which is directly incentivized by our profit-first economic model. Uh, second is this idea that design for abundance. Why? Well, look all around us. If any of us have a fruit tree, for example, you know that you know when the pear tree comes on big, there's a lot of pears that come off this thing or say the amount of seeds that are generated off of one simple seed head, thousands of seeds. Nature actually provides an incredible amount of abundance. Um, the amount of sunlight that comes onto this planet every day, totally adequate to meet our energy needs. We just have to be smarter about how we capture and convert it. Um, so recognizing that our central bank, if you will, of wealth is 
embedded right here in the natural systems of this place. And let's say we were sitting in Greenland right now. Well, we'd look around us, it'd be a different set of resources, but Greenland is just as abundant as Fairfield, Iowa. So this is the other principle about in-place economics. The future of economy is going to go from this vast globalization concept that was entirely created to maximize financial profit to reform itself into a more localized, diversified, in-place solution. If humanity is going to survive the planet, that's how we're going to have to do it. Um, and of course, tapping the genius of natural systems, uh, photosynthesis comes to mind. Wow, you know, taking all that sunlight, you know, some sugars and carbon and six elements out of the periodic table and it creates everything around us and it recycles itself. Wow, that's pretty amaz amazing. And of course, the examples are nature recycles everything. Of course, we've talked about nature rewards co cooperation. Nature curbs excesses from within. You know, nature does not um, maximize cellular growth uninhibited. It, you know, for us, we call that cancer. Nature has self-controlling mechanisms that minimize this idea of a monocropped universe. Uh, and of course, nature banks on diversity. Nature optimizes local conditions to enhance life. If any of you have read the book by Janine Benyus called Biomimicry, you'll recognize these principles I've just discussed. There are 26 of them. I highly recommend you go to Janine's uh, website, Biomimicry 3.8. Uh, it's a consulting firm that currently has contracts with 20 major corporations, rethinking their organizational design and their manufacturing process to better align with nature's principles. There are 26 in total that they've unearthed so far that reflect the actual pattern of how nature unfolds. Uh, so in my view, um, uh, one of the impacts of Janine's work on, for me as an investment advisor is thanks to uh, a mentor of mine, Hazel Henderson, back in 2003, we began thinking about how does this biomimicry um, idea, what role does it have in transforming finance into a more life-supporting uh, model? And so out of that, you can Google ethical biomimicry finance, uh, which again, integrates life's principles into established financial metrics and reinterprets how you would approach risk management, asset allocation, uh, expectations of financial returns, etc. In fact, if you look at modern economics, say for the last 120 years, say from 1900 to the present, if you actually were to measure it based on social uh, well-being, environmental health, and financial progress, uh, you've heard this term that over long term, the stock market returns something around 8% a year on average, plus or minus. That's solely measured in financial return, financial return on investment. If you actually were to account for the degradation of natural systems, you could actually come, I've seen this, uh, and again, you'd have to really dig deep about assumptions, but at best we're at break even more likely we're actually losing money when you think of the value of the natural capital that we've extracted to support our lifestyle and not replaced, or even set up the conditions where it can't replace itself. So we really have to be alert that we're living in a very, very narrow piece of time fueled by an economic model that somehow came up with financial profit is the only thing that matters. That's kind of crazy when you think about it. Uh, and fueled by fossil fuels, which, you know, talk about a treasure trove of concentrated energy. One gallon of crude oil. I mean, think about it. In my little Prius, I go 50 miles on one gallon of gasoline. It's incredibly energy dense, far more dense than you'll ever find in a, you know, wind or solar or batteries. So for that reason, part of the future um, engineering job of humanity is to do what 
Uh, many of you may have heard of a guy named Amory Lovins, who uh, founded the Rocky Mountain Institute. This is 35 years ago, Amory put forward that the future of, of human society is what he calls factor 10 engineering. We are going to have to apply creative intelligence uh, to engineer our lifestyle with 90% less energy input. That means energy efficiency, which is another principle of nature, super efficient all the time. Okay, so that, uh, we apply these principles to placemaking in our own backyard. So the, the concept is strategic, creative, and tactical. And the idea is that the fusion of the three-part model is to generate higher and higher quality places all around us. Um, so within the stakeholder map of Fairfield, these are some highlights for those of you who want to investigate how to get plugged in. The CoLab, of course, is an entrepreneurial incubator. MIU Student Body, Cliff Rose's Concept to Market Program, City of Fairfield, uh, the Community Re Resilience Plan, thanks to the Sierra Club. Uh, FIDA, Fairfield Economic Development Association, is really, uh, we are very fortunate to have FIDA in our mix because they, for literally decades, been working on how to uh, attract uh, opportunities to Fairfield. Of course, the school district, this is super important, and I saw Annie Pillay out there. We need to teach this biomimetic principles in science class, in economics class, so that our new crop of citizens understand the role of biomimicry. Health center, Fairfield area uh, convention center, um, the Chamber of Commerce, which is under new leadership, has quite dynamic stuff going on, and we need to weave all these stakeholders together so that we're actually moving in a coherent direction, somewhat like a laser. And from the outside, people like myself need to throw the cast out and attract family foundations who are looking for community experiments just like Fairfield to incentivize and inspire capital to come in to fuel this process. So my uh, charge to you all is to think about how you want to participate in placemaking within Fairfield. What are your gifts and skills? Is it art, artisan in nature, writing, you know, the, the performing arts? Is it economic in nature through entrepreneurship, et cetera? Is it strategic or uh, with respect to planning and uh, organizational design? Is it tactical like fixing a watershed? that needs some corrective activity. There's many, many areas, but all of it comes down to us as individuals within our community committing some of our time to placemaking. And that is the foundation of in-place in impact. So here's some uh, websites for the Sustainable Living Coalition, of which I'm part of, the Fairfield Colab, Economic Development Association, Maurice International University and of course the Sierra Club. Uh, so that is the gist of my talk. Thank you very much. And if there's any questions, this is a good time. On your first or second slide, there was the Leonardo da Vinci figure. Yeah. What are the P, the I, and the I? In place impact. In place, in place impact. I got it, thank you. <laughs> The underlying, underlying code. Yeah. David. Uh, wait, you got to use this. Win, win. Wait, wait, wait. I, I missed it. Win, win, win. Investors, community stakeholders, and what was the third key? Uh, the, the ecosystem itself in your place. So you've got you've to consider the impact on our environment for any sort of business initiative, investment. Win, win, win. So the third one was the yeah. local ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, yes, Susan. Yeah, I really like Wait. No, but it goes into a mic. Okay, I really like your uh, analogy about the survival of the fittest versus the fit, and I think that's an that's a real important takeaway for me. I've never heard that before, and if I haven't heard it, I think millions of others haven't heard it either. And unfortunately, the fittest, which does imply competition with each other, is the way this country has been run 
you know, since the beginning, and it just engenders a lot of problems. And if, if somehow you could get yourself your presentation and then elaborate more into uh, some farm bureau or some, <clears throat> some kind of regular, not an environmentalist group like this, but some kind of regular farm thing or agriculture seminar, and then you can bring these points home. It's like you've got to re-educate society. Uh, I assure you this conversation is happening at the highest levels of Wall Street and corporate America. I mean, really, I mean, I know we kind of put skull and crossbones onto Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan, but uh, these people, again, one of the good things about, quote, capitalism and the model we live in, these individuals who are highly competitive, profit-seeking, they're also super opportunistic. So they're looking for every angle. And biomimicry right now is kind of like nobody wants to talk about it but it is embedding itself throughout business and a lot of the design ex, uh, professions have you know, long since um, integrated biomimicry principles. If you've ever watched the wind turbine blades going down I-80, uh, look at the back end of it, they're ridged. Well, that is straight out of a humpback whale, right? Uh, that's how you minimize drag on the wind turbine blade and it's taken this is a very simplistic uh, biomimetic sort of process, but biomimicry is, I mean, one of my associates has done 10 case studies on major American companies that have integrated biomimetic principles into their process, and uh, Anne? Yeah, well, it's no surprise that nature has a lot more intelligence than human beings, for sure. Um, I don't want to ask too loaded of a question, but I will, because I think you've given us a pretty big load to think about. But if you look at Fairfield as an ecosystem, an economic, social, environmental ecosystem, and we are clearly not in balance. Um, we have very high levels of food insecurity. Um, we, we're considered living, we're pretty much at a poverty level um, from the county level, and so forth and so on. I can list a lot of things. And on the other hand, we've been a very innovative community. But if you took this as an ecosystem from your in-place investment model, where would you, where are the like, top couple places that you would make course corrections in order to bring us into that balance, an ecosystem balance? I guess this goes back to first things first. <laughs> what, what would be the first things first? Uh, in my view, and this is, I think, shared with the board of the Sustainable Living Coalition, when we kind of put everything up top and shake it through the screens again and again and again, it comes down to enhancing our local food system because of the multiplier effect it has on our society. So, you know, David's uh, garden project, for example, empowering people to uh, grow their own food, and if done in a way as Faith's uh, presentation on the Garden Initiative, you end up enhancing your local soils, you create better habitat for things like worms and nematodes and all that stuff that's under our feet that we never think about but it gives rise to greater uh, level of nutrition, greater individual health, uh, more opportunities for local businesses to process foods and sell locally and nationally. So I, I think that is the high leverage first opportunity we have is to actually work as a community in enhancing our food system, both in the production of nutrient-dense, uh, organically grown food, as well as how do we get that food into our local restaurants, our local marketplaces, and ideally, we have enough extra to support businesses that actually are producing food that can be stored throughout the winter, so this concept of resilience, uh, I think is the place to start. Um, I, th I think what the brilliant thing about that is not that it's food, but you've made food, you've connected food to everything else in the ecosystem. And I think there's a lot of angles you could take and achieve the same thing. I mean, I think it's brilliant. 
but I think also you could look at purely water quality. And if you took that angle alone and work that, you would end up all the same places as well. And I think the difference is the framing it within an ecosystem and addressing everything it touches within an ecosystem. And that's a change, that's a paradigm shift in the way we're thinking without thinking, it's just like going from monocropping to biodiversity. It's the same way of thinking. And so the question is how, is we, how can we as a community start to think like an ecosystem instead of thinking within silos? I think Stuart and I so this is a really interesting exercise for each of us to try on. Um, imagine there's no such thing as Stuart Valentine. I'm simply an organism in, in the ecosystem, living as nature in service of enhancing the conditions for life. That's a way different way to approach life and living, right? Instead, we got a whole, you know, again, hundreds of years of history that says, no, it's all about me. And here's the source code. Go out there and extract and exploit for the purpose of maximizing financial profit and you win. Because, I mean, when you think about it, that's like a crazy ass idea, excuse my French, but that is really not the way this species is going to survive much on the planet. I mean, we're what, 200,000 years old? That's like that. I mean, Mother Nature holds all the trump cards here and it's like, you know, figure out how to get aligned with how to enhance life on Earth. You will prosper, you will flourish, um, but the, you have to really step back and examine what I call the, the unexamined assumptions that we've all inherited since birth that are flat out not uh, leading in the direction of long-term health and wellness. So, you know, this is going to take a lot of creativity. Uh, I don't have the answers, but I know that they're out there with the right level of attention and experimentation and, yes, risk-taking. Because, you know, we don't know the answers. There, there, there is a role for taking risks in all this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you had a slide which had a list of the key stakeholders in Fairfield. I was curious to know what is your step-by-step -step vision of having them all align, um, you know, with the in-place investing? Yeah, okay. Well, it's, uh, it's a really good question. So it's, we've identified some. I'm sure there's many more. It takes, flat out, it takes, you know, this concept of paying attention? Well, uh, I look around me in this room. I see a lot of people that pay attention. It requires a commitment, passion, and actually getting up every day and making the phone calls or meeting the people, getting the communication down to where, again, the, how to create a, a group of disparate or seemingly disparate stakeholders aligned and coherently directed in one direction like a laser. So uh, there's just, I don't know any substitute for just spending time on this with, uh, with vision. I, I use the term visioneering. So first establish the vision, say, of a society that is flourishing, it's uh, got a, a quality of life that is joyful and healthy. All right, so we set that out as our vision and now it's our job to engineer the, the, the pathway forward to get there. And I don't know any other way on a community basis to get there other than uh, collaboration and cooperation. And if I may be so bold as to say it, I think that's the whole vision behind our sustainability coordinator project. Yeah. And uh, that's, you know, it's, it's a big job and that's what we're going to at least try to go in that direction. Yeah. And you're part of that. And I think one of the really challenges here ahead of us is that um, it's kind of hard to hear this message when uh, you've positioned yourself um, sort of in, uh, uh, this is just the tree hugger Earth Day narrative, right? We have to really build bridges here and we have to listen very carefully to those who would say, no, the profit first thing makes total sense to me. 
uh, well, okay, show me how, that, how that's going to lead to this, uh, what Charles Eisenstein, uh, he has a great quote, that more beautiful world in our hearts we know is possible. I want to go there. That's where I, that's sort of a, a, a kind of a North Star for me. And, you know, how do we do that when we see all around us the, the shadow dimensions of the economic system that we have inherited? I think it's incumbent on us to understand that we invented it. We're easily, not easily, but we are certainly capable of uh, expanding the design parameters, setting new objectives based on our collective shared values. Um, so my question is about making that paradigm shift that you're talking about, like as a young investor, as a young person, if I want to invest the little money I have, the, the, the mindset will always be like, okay, if maybe I should first get as much profit as I can and then think about in-place investing. So uh, how, what would you say to someone like me? Uh, first, I would... Uh, just point out that nature is profitable. I wouldn't, I mean, I get a lot of feedback that financial profit is somehow evil. Well, when it's out of balance and toxic, yes, it does harm. But I would say pursue the investment uh, sort of um, plan with balance in mind. Is this product and service, again, enhancing human well-being and environmental health? That option is as directly available to you today as it's ever been, thanks again to the last 20 years of evolving from socially responsible investment principles to environmental social governance or ESG analysis and now into impact investments. So there is a vast um, share of Wall Street activity that's engaged in this. There are publicly traded funds that uh, and exchange traded funds that do what's called shareholder activism. So you're not just buying into a, a fund that owns companies, but this, the fund management actively is involved in introducing shareholder resolutions to improve the internal dynamics of the company itself. And this has been very effective in the last 25 years or so in helping companies evolve into uh, more responsible citizens and more environmental accountability. So you have direct public market options, and I would just say keep an eye out for your locale. Uh, where can you look for opportunities in your own backyard, much like nature does? Nature doesn't you know, have a tree that accumulates a bunch of nutrients inside that trunk and then sends it you know, across to the Sahara. It completely recycles all that nutrient base into the local ecosystem. So we have to think about where could our uh, opportunities to pollinate and uh, provide resources locally. Okay. Thank you.